Okay, so if you want to just grab the QR code there, or if you're used to it, it's T9ANYUPR on PPT.MS. Just use it on your phone. It's something which we use at everything. It's great to see Moodle supporting more inclusive presentations like this. I'm really proud of Moodle. Lead from the front. Let's give you one or two more seconds. And the one thing I love about this is you can rewind the presenter, which is a bit difficult in real life. <laughs> I'll explain what it means in a moment. So when you're in it, that's cool. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the rollout of our accessibility toolkit. So as you know, in Moodle Core, there's a version of it, we call it Starter. And if our full toolkit is like a, a 10 course meal, Starter is your, your aperitif. There's an awful lot of extra cool stuff in there. And part of that is an awful lot of supports for staff, supports for the, the teachers, the students, the institution reporting, all that fun stuff. So when an institution comes to think about it, they need to go, well, how are we going to roll this out? Because it is a tool kit. So there's many things and levers that they can choose to use. So I'm going to very quickly and initially go through some of those, just to give you a bit of context. So yeah, put that in just to make everybody smile. So the first aspect is around finding. We just mantra of find, fix, future proof because accessibility is a journey. So when you find a problem, you want to fix it, and then you want to stop it happening into the future. And that requires three things. It requires, firstly, technology. Secondly, a culture of accessibility first. But it also requires capacity building, staff skills, digital skills, and understanding of why. And that is paramount. It's one of the foundational concepts of how we approach it. So when you're finding it, our system helps you analyze within Moodle. I know obviously all these slides get shared afterwards. Produce reporting, but we also break it down from what we call a functional view, what's broken in Moodle, and what type of content it is, and why. On the fixing, we have automated tools to try and deal with it. We have um, interfaces then to triage and bulk fix. And I'll show you there's a slide near the end um, as an example of a rollout. So it's like adding alt text to images. Adding, creating descriptive links. Really important, it's like descriptive file names. If you were to sort of think to yourself and go, do I have a policy or do we have a policy of how we name files, or are they all slides1.pdf when you give them to the students? Just think about when they've got 10 modules of slides1.pdf. Descriptive links and descriptive files, cool thing. Converting all caps to sentence case. I love seeing paragraphs in caps and stuff, but also to remove some technical errors. When I learned to teach IT, um, gosh, it was 26 years ago, my capstone project was a three-week curriculum in teaching Microsoft Word. Eight hours a day, three weeks, whatever it was, 24 hours of scheme of works of teaching Word. And that's what you needed then. Now it's about six weeks to fully learn Microsoft Word. Problem is, no one wants to spend more than three minutes learning any feature of anything nowadays. So they never know actually what they should be doing. It used to be called desktop publishing, now it's WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get, hopefully. But then future-proofing. So we, we, we implement things like editor nudging. We implement features that improve usability. And usability and accessibility are really tightly integrated. But you know what? If it's not usable, it won't be accessible. But technically, it can be accessible, but not usable. And that's a head wrecker. Just think about group management in Moodle for, for a teacher. 300 teachers, you want to get them into groups of five, specific groups. How much fun that is. That's an accessible interface. But is it practical? <laughs> then we've got user preference to control visual display, student self-service, student training. We're working on that at the moment, that students will be taught how to be accessible, inclusive allies with their other students as well as Amazingly, submitting accessible assignments and then capacity building. And for students, that's the self-service aspect of letting them convert content into formats that they want. Imagine that. So it's not a teacher going, I'm going to lock down my content. No one can edit it. They can't download it. And if they do, I want the IP police at their door. However, the student goes, you know what? I'd like to listen to those lecture notes on the way home today while I'm cycling. So they want it as an MP3. Imagine there being a difference in opinion there. 
And then we have these multiple layers of constantly supporting user tours, heavily underused in Moodle, um, onboarding workshops, online courses, and they're unlimited. When someone buys our product, every single one of their staff, their lecturers, their IT support, their HR, HR documents are usually the most challenging or inaccessible because they were designed for printing for contracts. Oh, makes me cry. Then we've got also accessibility guides and tips. So we've got all these, and can you imagine all of these as a set of levers that any institution can choose which ones they want to pull and in what order. It's like whack-a-mole with all of these different mole holes and you have to choose what you're gonna do. So for example, DCU, and we'll just go through this one first, and I'll talk about some other examples. So they were rolling it out, you, DCU you are presenting here, they presented up most Moodle moves recently, they're really engaged and wanting to improve, especially around UDL. But they have this people first approach, which is really key to what they do. So using it for 18 years, if oodles of online courses and loads of content built in Moodle, but also they've got a few of those PDFs and SCORM objects and H5P packages, all those fun things that really are harder to make accessible. But they wanted to create supports to foster a culture of inclusion. It's that second pillar of having a culture that think accessibility first. A student shouldn't need to walk around with an arrow on their head to, be, to get accessible materials. They shouldn't need to be self-identifying if there's no need, especially with neurodivergent students. So, because they may, may or may not know that they have a disability and may or may not want to disclose their disability. Improving the content, enabling students to do what they need when they need it. Because as a student, I've looked at online material, built in book when I was learning in a course. But equally, when I was wanting to look at it on my iPad, I was choosing to download it as an ebook to look at it offline or then listen to it as an MP3. So three different formats, but there's nothing to do with a disability. It's to do with situational need. It's like captions if you're going to watch a video in a library. Other people in the library may object, maybe, if you had your volume on watching the videos. So, but that last one also needs to scaffold skill development. So. Obviously, we'd worked with them on lots of amazing projects and have some really cool, super cool compass, competency-related stuff, which if you can track down Rob Lowney, I know he's here this week. Pardon? What? Oh, he's there! Okay, so if you can track him down, <laughs> you want to get him to show you his competency stuff, because they've done amazing stuff, especially on their award-winning onboarding for students, which I must admit, I've worked with hundreds of universities in the last 20 years, and that onboarding is shit hot. Pardon my language, and I hope it translated onto the captions well. <laughs> um, so they went through piloting on a clone site, which is a good way of finding out how big the mountain is you're going to climb. And then they moved to production and provide the, using that ongoing training bit by bit, because you know what, this is a journey. You want to overwhelm staff, they're busy. COVID came along and went, hey, you know what? All of you who taught online teaching wasn't a thing. Uh-uh. <laughs> Welcome, smell the roses. So, um, so it helped support their UDL process, which they've been really leading um, in Ireland and producing amazing work there. Implemented in the five faculties. The students have embraced converting books and pages and stuff into other formats like there is no tomorrow. It is brilliant. Because they're basically choosing what they need. They don't need to go to the teacher going, hey, can I have that PDF as a Word document? I want to use Immersive Reader on it. No, they just convert it to a Word document. Because that's what they need and they know their needs. But also then the staff can report on what happened, not who did it. So they can see lots of people are cre using DocX. So now they go, okay, maybe I should be using DocX as my base format if so many are converting to it. And then also starting the staff CPD. Now, DCU are not unusual in how they rolled it out. They went slow and built plans and start implementing them bit by bit and fitted it into the other projects that they were working with. But one of the interesting things is when we look across all of our clients and how they have rolled it out, it is so utterly different everywhere. So one big institution who, again, similar to university, 
They actually don't use it on the live courses as such they do, but it's, that's not where it's mainly used. They have a QA curriculum team in-house who pre-check all course content before it goes live the following year. That's a really centralised approach. So they use the toolkit for that, and they make sure it's fixed before it goes live. Not just have it, and so it takes it away from the teacher, the SME, that subject matter expert, the, those lecturers, or should I say researchers, who are told they have to do lecturing. Those researchers who create the content, they give it off, it's made better, usable, and then it's put onto the live system. So this QA process, which is great because it fits into their ways of working, but not everyone works that way. Another university, Concordia, in, in Canada, they presented myself um, last year at a conference where they did two different pilots to see which way was going to work best for them. One where they had staff, gave them very light training, and then let them loose on the toolkit. Now, the toolkit is pretty usable. One of our clients went live in 22 hours after saying hello to us because they were replacing some other tool that shall not be named. And, but they were live on their system 22 hours later, which is quite cool, really. Um, but then th they didn't even do the onboarding. They just got on with it because it is pretty usable. However, for those staff who weren't used to online and content, QA, HTML, accessibility, because they've learned about spelling and grammar since you're three years old. Suddenly, digital accessibility sweeps in and goes, this is just as important as spell checking your document. But you don't have 27 years or whatever it is of experience in this area. So you suddenly have to scale up. So the second one, they had students doing the work and really heavily trained them. We worked with them in workshops and then they worked with the staff. So much better, surprisingly. If you want to win a Formula One race, you need to learn how to drive or at least know what a car is. Decentralized support is another one which is really popular where they actually look for champions in different departments and really scale them up and provide a lot of centralized support to those individuals who then work within that department because they will know the type of challenges they have. So if it's very much maths based, STEM based. So that's another really popular one and I'd say probably a third use that decentralized one. They really target building champions. In fact, one, one institution in the States created the B team. When I asked, them, I asked them, why was it the A team for accessibility, which, you know, it's the Brickfield team. <laughs> so, I always thought we were the A team, you know, I want to be, I want all that gold jewellery, yeah? I think I'd look good, maybe. And this is another example of, actually, because one of the ways that we work with our clients, and when they were doing the rollout, um, one of our first pilots came back with 60 pages of feedback. And number one was a button that just fixes everything. It's not in our roadmap. Karen looked at it and went, amazing feedback, but are they serious? <laughs> and I went, yeah, you know, everyone wants a button to do everything. However, one of the other institutions that we work with, they really engaged during their first year usage and while they were doing it on their training and pilot sites and came back with some really strong recommendations on how we should improve it. And this was one of the things where we have this is where we have these wizards. The teacher gets a list of all these images in their course that don't have alt text or have inadequate, inadequate alt text. So if they've put in dog.png, so the file name, as the alt text, unlikely. There's only one occasion where that alt text is correct. Can anyone tell me? Literally one scenario. If the image has dog.png, as text and nothing else. <laughs> Any other time the file name is not suitable. So what we do is we show the existing alt text, if any. We have an update area, but then we show the image within the context of the content on the page. And they can click a button to see the whole thing. So it's like a really long page with lots of images. They can see it all. So they can understand where it is, how it fits in to create the best possible alt text. And this kind of contextual stuff is a big change for us, and it's literally being rolled out to our clients in the next two weeks. So we're really proud of that, mainly because it came from multiple clients making suggestions. Karen, who's our chief product officer there in the second row in front of Rob. I'll oh, put your hand up there. OK, I have to embarrass her at least once. She's my wife, so you know, <laughs> she'll get me back later. Um, and, but that, that feedback loop is absolutely crucial to how we work. So we work and get feedback from clients to improve the product. 
So this was their way of rolling it out. They looked at it, saw the efficiency from their perspective, suggested an improvement. It happened. However, then you also have different approaches. So because from my background before, I knew that institutions really like having their own branded videos when it comes to instructional things, teaching people how to use a tool. So we actually didn't provide loads of online courses, but we didn't do the videos of the screencasts. So these ones did some amazing videos, really cool, but they turned them into like a mini six minute teaching moment where they had maybe three to four minutes of talking about descriptive links, the good, the bad, the ugly, why it was important. And then they showed how the wizard would use, be used to fix it. So it was a really cool way of doing it. And we're going to copy them, let's be clear. Um, so that's really cool. Love it. Amazing stuff. Another one created an onboarding course. So we provide all of these on online courses for their staff. But they went, you know what? We want a first step. <laughs> Literally just a first step. So they pulled down some of the essential bits and they put them into their own course that they have locally, which is fine within our agreement. The main courses have to be through our site because our site actually demonstrates accessible layout for neurodivergent students, which just means everybody. So that's important. But they had this first step in their own Moodle site, and then once they finished it, then they were encouraged to go and register for the other courses. Another one rolled out focused monthly webinars. So one month, they focused on accessible links. Did a short, a short webinar, chatting about it, and then shared materials send them off to the various courses and introduce the wizards and so on. So they did this as a monthly theme to keep on building the skills over time. Because one of the things that teachers had told them was that they were terrified that people would expect them just to fix this immediately. And in one of the, one of the courses, there was 200,000 errors. Yeah, you know, when you put a page together of just URLs to everywhere in the world, it's going to be a lot. And of course, then they open them all in new windows. So it was like doubling up on errors. It was great fun. However, they were calmed down when it was, hey, you know, this is a two year journey. And then they also prioritized content types. Another one of them prioritized content types for correction. Again, giving this journey effect, which is really important to staff because they are going to go, you know what? And actually, I was in a, a call just last week and the person said to me, you're expecting me to learn a whole new way of working. Every, every item in their course had to be fixed. Every resource, everything was PDFs, which had been created according to the practice before they knew it was wrong. And, but they just went, you know, what do you expect here? So steps, and you prioritize. And in this case, here's a table which shows this was their opinion, this is, also, so this is how they presented it internally, which was potential impact, high and low, and whatever was easier and harder. And all of the icons were related to our six content types, which is really important. So I remember when I was presenting to a university over in North America as part of a sales thing, I sort of asked them, so what's your stance on um, plagiarism and this lovely um, academic um, said, we're against it. That isn't quite, it isn't quite what I meant, you know, and certainly my sense of humour didn't carry across the water, shall we say. And what I actually meant to say, okay, that's good, but are you the hammer or the educator? Do you use it to beat and hammer your students if they make a mistake, deliberately or otherwise? Or using it to educate them about how to do citations correctly, how to quote correctly, paraphrase, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they went, "Oh, definitely the, the education side." But accessibility is the same thing. Are you talking about compliance, like you know, when you do your health and safety um, training as part of your sort of yearly HR stuff? You know, everyone really enjoys going through those one-hour SCORM objects, which are usually neither accessible, fun, or well. Usable, maybe, but it's just, uh. So compliance is one thing. Yes, there's a law involved, and actually one of our clients bought our product after being sued. Would have been better if they'd bought it before being sued, <laughs> but that's okay. So it was very much, you know, when you look at it, it's, we have these six content types, which greatly fit on a cube. And if you haven't got your cube, you should drop by our stand. And the idea is we're talking about content and how to do it better. 
So if you're going to use images, here's a list of things of how you can do images better, more inclusive, more accessible. If you're going to use links, this is how you should use links, and so on. Because everyone who's building courses already has some foundational knowledge of these content types, so we're building on top of that. You don't want to build a whole new building and have to do the whole foundations as well. So that's why we started it that way. So it's very much about supporting the teacher and learning in their journey. So, so if you haven't got a cube, you can download the PDF from brickfield.ie slash tips and then you can get these printed yourself or while we have them, they're going quickly, you can drop by the stand and say hello and collect them. Any questions? Am I allowed to ask questions? There's a, a few minutes. Still got five minutes. Got five minutes. There you go. Any questions? Any thoughts? Any abuse? Yes. If, if you can go back to the slide before, uh, please. Well, actually, you can do it on your phone. So that was the one cool thing, by the way, about the phone. If you actually look at the top where it has the slides, you can rewind. I'll do it here anyway. But you can actually rewind to previous slides. Which is why it makes it really cool to use that in a normal lecture. But go on there. Just a question, what content type is the, the four black squares there? Okay, so it was layout. Ah, uh, okay, layout, yeah? cool. So the idea Thanks. is image, link, layout, media, text, and tables. The problem is people use tables. I remember a blind lecturer telling me, you know, Gavin, you know, nested tables. There's only one location that nested tables work. Can anyone tell me? You know the answer to that, so you're not. And that's in your living room. <laughs> nested tables have no place in digital content. None. Because they make it harder. And if you want to try to create an, an equivalent ease of use environment, don't make it harder. <laughs>